Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Brad. Welcome to the podcast. How are you today? I'm great, Michael. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, um, my pleasure. And uh, thanks for getting up early in the morning. Um, about around just gone 8 a.m. for you. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, I used to so, work for a British company. And even yeah. to this day, I still don't get the time difference. Isn't that terrible? I, I have no <laughs> idea what time it is. You, you must be around 1, 1 p.m.? 12 noon? That's correct. Yeah, I'll that's correct. Right. Yeah, Good. well done. Yeah. Now we, because we're kind of, because, you know, Great Britain or United Kingdom is in like in the middle of the world, we have to be very sensitive to the time zones going one way and the other way around the world. So, yeah, we, we get used to that at an early age, I think. Yeah. Okay, Brad, I'm going to start just an opening question, and and that is, um, tell the listeners a little bit about your story, your background. So, where were you born? Have you moved around? You know, your schooling, education, your first job, career, and then we'll deep dive into how you got into what you're doing today. So, I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, you know, as a small business owner, I've told this story different ways, different times. So. Uh, forgive me if it's a bit rehearsed, but I, I lived it. I know it, so to speak. That's fine. Absolutely um, fine. I'm, I'm in the United States and um, I grew up on the Eastern seaboard of the United States. And so uh, I was born in Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, um, inconspicuous town really, and um, lived there until we were about six. And then we moved to Washington, D.C., but Indiana is important because it's where something really important happened. Um, if anyone's old enough to know, I don't know about in the UK, I'm sure you, you folks did this in the UK, but you know, in the 1960s, um, women who were affluent you know, would, would go to lunch at the department store dining rooms. And uh, there you have white tablecloth and a nice lunch. And through the dining room, these models would walk through with fashions of the day. And my mother was a very beautiful model. And um, my father owned an airline at the time. Right. And we were wealthy for a minute. Uh, and then it went away. But right. during the time, um, my mother was a fashion plate, uh, society and parties. We would go to a department store called LS Airs. And I remember the dining room clearly. We went several times. I don't know yeah. about all. I, I was five and then six. But uh, I remember my, my sisters would come and we were always dressed up. I was always in a suit. My sisters were in their dresses. My mother, you know, you always dressed properly. And um, there we are in this dining room and the boys got boys coloring books. The girls got girl coloring books, you know, and it was very proper. And, mm -hmm. and this one time, Michael, I remember I was sitting there and it was all white. The walls were white. Um, the ceiling was white. The tablecloth was white. The chandeliers were crystal. The sunlight yeah. was coming through the room and our table was right next to a column, a huge column that was either smooth or fluted. I don't remember, but I do remember up at the top, it was a Corinthian capital, which I didn't know then, but I know now the carving. Right. And there was this moment where I sat there and I just knew it. I was six years old and I knew I was going to be part of this world. Wow. Now, I think I could have said to you, it wasn't as much about the fashion but I don't know that I would have been able to articulate that it was about the built environment, um, the feeling, the right. trans transformative effect that when you come into a space like that. So as I was growing up, seven, eight, nine, I started to learn very quickly that, um, well, and remember now this, in the UK listeners, I think will understand this. There was a time where being gay was really bad and being homosexual you could be killed it was yeah. bad and some people don't know that today but anyway so there i was in the 1960s and i thought this was going to be great i i could and i learned very quickly all of those guys have a limp wrist and they're homosexuals and i thought i can't do that i just can't mm. i'm not i'm not that guy i um it turned out i was but later in the story so yeah i just pushed it underneath. And I started to tell people I was going to be a doctor. 
And, right. you know, my mother would, would introduce whatever, Oh, Brad, you know, when, what are you going to be? I'm going to be a doctor. And they look at my mother, Oh, Donna, a doctor. And he's so handsome, you know, and I thought, <laughs> well, this is working, you know? And so my, <laughs> my whole adolescent life and all, I'm going to be a doctor and mm. that would be fine. You know, um, you don't realize that you push something down. You don't really realize that you push it away. Um, yeah. Because I remained fascinated with the fabrics, the lighting. What is it? And I started to just learn and take it in. My mother decorated our homes. Um, and then we, and, and then right after six years old, we moved to Washington, D.C. And, uh, you know, I told everybody I'm going to be a doctor. And they mm. looked at my mother, Donna, a doctor. Oh, you know. So um, this is really working. I love it. I learned how to be charming. And yeah. um, uh, so fast forward to living in Washington, D.C. My parents were very gregarious. My father no longer owned an airline. We were upper middle class. Um, but, my, you know, we had a beautiful apartment. My parents entertained a lot. And sort of the, the social mix, uh, being a social butterfly. And we went out a lot. And what, like we did it anywhere, anywhere we would go out. My parents would, we would dress up, we would get in the Cadillac yeah. and we would go to fine restaurants in Washington. And I, I learned at an early age, this cultural hospitality, gregariousness and, and an international climate. Um, right. You know, I, I remember being in DC and you stand on a street corner and right next to you is a guy from Iran but coming mm -hmm. across the intersection is a woman from Paris. And you can tell she's from Paris, the way she's dressed, just gorgeous. Right. But over here, you have someone speaking Spanish and then you have African-American people. Uh, Where's he from? Trinidad? You know, it's just this mix. And at our house, everyone was welcome. And we always had different people. And you grow up, if you live inside the Beltway, our, our circular highway, you, you live inside the Beltway, you're in a um, crucible of politics, diplomacy, yeah, and, and a certain way things work, which mm. doesn't make it doesn't make sense to a lot of people. Washington is of its own brand, but it is about power and status, and it's about yeah. access, you know, access to the Oval Office. And you never lose sight that you're living in the most powerful city in the world. And right there is the White House with the president. Um, mm -hmm. back then it didn't matter who the president was. You respected the president, you know, and yeah. there could be a presidential motorcade over here. There could be whatever. And so I learned at an early age, um, diplomacy, hospitality, table manners, grammar, and a finer way of living. Sure. Um, my mother was careful with our grammar and sit up straight. And when you dance with a woman, you hold her back this way. Um, details that became so important later in life. And so I guess I was informed very much by the city itself, the architecture and the layout. Um, uh, Pierre L'Enfant designed Washington, D.C. Um, and you can feel the echoes of Paris with our wide boulevards. And there's, there's a, a height limit in Washington. You cannot build higher than the dome of the Capitol. And so, oh, really? Mm -hmm. And if you ever never knew that, wow. And, and if you kind of look at photos or you're there, you may not realize it because, you know, you're in Washington, DC and there's a, but if you look around, you're like, where's all the skyscrapers? Where's all yeah. these, the dark canyons, you know, like in New York where you, mm. you go down block after block and it's just gray canyons. No, mm. like, like, uh, like Paris, you know, there's this beautiful feeling of openness. And, right. and I, I think abundance. And when you're at the Smithsonian museums and you're on the mall or you're just on Connecticut Avenue or wherever the trees, the openness, the lower height, a lot of sunshine. And I, I became very enamored. I didn't know it, but I was becoming enamored with classical architecture, classic form. And you realize that, you know, if the Democrats leave the White House and the Republicans come in, there's stylistic changes that happen everywhere. So if everybody just does classic, we're good through the changes through the years. And so right. I never got into trendy ideas. I didn't, you know, color of the year. But there I was growing up 
and in high school and things. And I remember my high school guidance counselor was giving me this test. And you have to know, Michael, in high school, I was a little bit of a fashion plate. I'm a good looking guy. I got some girlfriends here and I'm friends with everybody. And it's like, I'm, I'm gregarious and I'm, mm. I have a certain look and style. And this mm. woman sat me down and said, now the results of your test show. And I'm like, yeah, doctor, yeah. Okay. psychiatrist, give it to me. What? Yeah. <laughs> she said, you'd be better in the trades. I said, <laughs> what? I don't know what that is. No. <laughs> I know what I the trades? What? She said, you know, like a plumber. Oh, right. <laughs> I said, electrician. <laughs> are you yeah. kidding me? I mean, I think I was 15. I said, are you kidding me? And then I got up and just walked out. I'm like, woman, you don't even know me. You can't, you no. can't be serious, right? So the silliness, you know, that, that things try to hold you back in life. And there's plenty mm. of those to share. We don't have time, but um, no. we all get kicked along the road. And, um, but I was learning more and more um, the social graces, uh, private clubs to get into. And Washington has a feeling of closed doors, you know, limousines with blacked out windows and then mm. little doors with a dorm in there that, you know, you have to know to get it. It's about power and access. Yeah. So in Washington, I learned maybe around 17 and 18, this is a city that demands interior designers and architects and, and many other things, fashion. And you have to look right. You have to have it right. You have to be able to be at the country club and say, well, you know, my designer is Mary Douglas mm -hmm. Drysdale. Yeah. Thomas Pheasant. These, these big designers in Washington, Justine Sancho, Barbara Hawthorne. And uh, boy, I knew them. I knew their names. I knew their work. I read all the shelter magazines. I'm in college. And somewhere in college, I start to realize, because I'm a doctor, right? And I'm yeah. in my freshman year and there's bio, I love biology, anatomy and physiology. It's great. Yeah. And, and then there was chemistry. Michael, did you know in pre-med there's actually chemistry? Do you know no, that? I didn't know. I no. didn't. What? And it's like, what is this chemistry? Well, it's kind of theoretical, but not really. And I'm like, no, it's very theoretical and I don't get it. And I'm out. I just couldn't. No. Uh, and, and coincidentally, my father died very unexpectedly. And so oh. I had, a, I was thrown for a real loop uh, going into my sophomore year in, in university. So yeah. I regrouped and I just got a business degree, like a default thing. But coincidentally, it was a very good education. It was a brand new business department. So I have my degree. And by this point, I've been a waiter in restaurants. I mean, I started a dishwasher. There's a, but I learned that you could make $100 a night back then. It would be $200 yes. a night. But you can do it either, you know, outdoors in an apron and you could serve crabs on brown paper tablecloths, you know, and you could just have lemons and beer and crabs and be outside and you could do that. Or you could wear a tuxedo and be in a chandelier dining room and also serve and make to say, I'm a, I'm a chandelier guy. So of course, yes, <laughs> there I was in Washington with my tuxedo with these Latino men who this is their career, you know, and, mm. and. It's an art form. And, and this is high dining. It's very, very fancy restaurants. And um, I'll plug another podcast. I was on a, I was a guest on a podcast from Canada and it's called food is culture. And the woman is named Billy buttery, believe it or not. And she's mm -hmm. charming, but she and I had this big discussion about hotels and fine dining and linens and the stories. And if you care, you can jump over and listen to the episode. Um, you know, lubricating society and manners. We tell, we called it. So anyway, mm. uh, I waited, I waited on Nancy Reagan and Edwin Meese. You know, I, 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 I waited tables for a firm uh, a catering company. that was very famous and Claire Booth loose names. You may not know these days, but it was very big and very important at the Blair house and so forth. And um, really kind of got indoctrinated into the hotel, restaurant, food and beverage industry. And there I was. I was kept getting promoted to restaurant manager. And uh, pretty soon I was promoted to a food and beverage director of a hotel. And I've always, always been in luxury environments. It seems to fit. And um, I think I was 26 as a food and beverage director of a, of a known hotel. And uh, I was too young to do that. And uh, yeah. I don't think I did a really great job. 
but they, they liked me. They must have thought I did because I got promoted to our premier property in Washington, D.C., and it's on Washington Circle. There's an <clears throat> all-sweet hotel there with the restaurant down below, and it was this famous West End Cafe, and it was the New American Cuisine, and Janet Terry was the chef, and this and that, and I said, isn't this amazing? When I was a kid, my parents took us to the same restaurant I, I was 12 and it was um, circle one and it was red leather banquettes, French waiters, and, you know, very, very French. And I thought, here I am. I am the food and beverage director of this property. Incredible. How, how the circle comes around. Incredible. Oh, oh I'm not done yet. <laughs> Today <laughs> I have a friend. Gee, I don't know if I can share that. So, um, mm. There may be an opportunity for me as an interior designer to go back to that same property. Brilliant. But I love how life comes around, how the universe mm. delivers a circle that way. So, um, yeah, I was a food and beverage director, luxury properties, big time. It's really fun. Then, you know, assistant general manager and manager. And I worked for a, a lovely, lovely resort, really. Um, and I'll share it. The um, take a break. Sorry, Michael. The um, the property was on the eastern shore, and uh, the it was uh, owned by Sir Bernard Ashley, and uh, Laura Ashley's husband had a passion for fine inns, and in Wales, there was his premier property called Blangoid Hall. Very beautiful English house, you know, really high end, proper. And in America, he found uh, this white colonial revival home on the water and uh, Perry Cabin. And so when I worked there, it was at the height of its luxury. And um, I worked for a British company. You know, it was very, uh, it was very much on London time zone. Mm. And um, I don't know why, but I, ingratiated myself in, in certain areas. And to this day, I still use the British spelling of the word honor, flavor, <laughs> <laughs> realize, realize is with an S. <clears throat> I don't know. I just do that because you had, you had so much correspondence. Yeah. You, and a lot of it was written by fax, you know, before yeah, yeah. email wasn't really big then. So anyway, but the point is, is that I was enmeshed in this, this food and beverage world hotels, but I, I couldn't stop with the interior design. And, and if we had a dining room that needed to be done, I got it. I got it. We don't need it. To, look, we're going to do these walls in a suede. I want these banquettes to be sort of a, a green, a sage green. And the tablecloths are going to be pink and blah, blah, blah. I just, everywhere I touch my own home, uh, do we need a bar in the lobby? Let's do this. I can sketch it out and whatever. So. But did you have any training? No. No, you just did that because you were surrounded. You just absorbed that from all the properties that you visited from a very young age. And I just, think, yes, I, yeah. I think, I think what it really was, I didn't know it, but it was just this, the French word, you know, fait compli. It was a predetermined outcome that hadn't happened yet. And I mm. it was osmosis, Michael. It was, it was yeah. anything. Anything that I ever saw, I absorbed. And I was reading yeah. all the shelter magazines. And I'm like, what kind of fabric is that? Well, you look in the back and it's a printed cotton called Tweet de Joy. Oh, wow. Okay. And you learn, you just, you osmosis. I don't right. know. But I had no formal training. And, no. and, and I made mistakes, you know, and, and uh, those might be in terms of scale, you know. Yeah. Never in terms of color. You know, I got, I got that. I don't know. So mm. I kind of evolved into a... Um, a uh, real estate management, uh, uh, an apartment, multifamily, furnished corporate housing. Uh, it's worldwide. You may have heard of Oakwood corporate housing. Mm. And I worked with them. And again, I kind of moved up the ranks. I, I became very successful. I loved it. I love the company and its culture. But again, I was managing apartment buildings that had lobbies and party rooms. Hallways had to be redone. Um, 
whether I was in the premier property in Chicago, the high rise downtown, or I was in a more suburban apartment. I got this. If we need new sconces, I'll pick them up. We don't need, you know, and um, I thought this is now, of course, by college, I had learned that interior decorators aren't gay. I mean, they're not, I mean, that was what it doesn't matter. Do you know how many straight men are interior designers? Well, I didn't know that. And there <laughs> I was, I was in college and I was like, well, dude, you missed the boat, you know, because you need, you need training and a degree for this. I mean, that's right. it, a high level you can, and now you've screwed up because you've just got a business degree. You're not going back to school again. You won't be doing this. Mm. So for the second time in my life, the universe was saying to me, you, you're not able to do this. We're not going to let right. you be this de decorator business. So, uh, but there I was with, you know, property management, real estate management. And there I worked really hard to be a good manager of people. I, my hotel times were not always the best manager out of me. Mm -hmm. So I loved managing people. I was one of 12 mentors in the world for this company. And, um, right. And I got many, many skills in terms of executive presentation and the management and the financials. And, but, you know, I just couldn't get away from this interior decoration and the architecture mm. and all of it. And I found a luxury home builder. Well, I didn't find him. I knew of him, but I realized you could go and sit in this beautiful model home, million dollar home back at the time, decorated beautifully. And you get to sit there dressed nicely show people around and sell people houses. You can show them where their bay window might go. You could do a little addition back here. If you choose this home site, you'll have a view of the mountain. You could, and I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And I went and I interviewed and the young president said to me, why on earth would I hire you to sell my mill? You've never sold a thing in your life. You've never been in sales. Mm. And I'm going to let you sell my million dollar homes. And I said, yeah, I don't know, but I know one thing in your Carter's Grove model, the staircase, you can flip it so that when it goes the other way, you really can add the morning room here and your salespeople don't know that. And the Brandenburg model does this. And I, I just knew things. And he said, okay, we're going to test you, which they did. And then uh, I thought they'd call me back in a week or so and probably not do well on the test. They're probably not going to hire. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah call me, they called me the very next morning and said, can you come in? And I said, sure. Um, Friday, they said, no, now. And I'm like, I can't, I'm at work. Um, this evening, you know, later this afternoon. And I did, and they had the major corporate vice president of marketing there. And then this man who was the division president. And they said, tell us where you've sold before. And I said, well, when I was in high school, I sold at a clothing store. No, no, no. Seriously. Where have you sold? And I said, I haven't really, you know, you know that. Yeah. This test you took, uh, the company called us right away and they didn't know if it was an error. So they looked at it. You, you scored very high. And I said, <laughs> no, I did. Yeah. No, Brad, you scored higher than anybody has ever scored on this test that they do. And they were a bit alarmed. You've certainly scored higher than anyone that we've interviewed. I said, I, I don't know. I don't know. It could be a mistake, you guys, because I, I don't, I don't know. They said, okay, mm. we're going to take a chance on you. And they did. And boy, I learned how to sell. They had a beautiful program and I learned how to sell in a consultative manner, you know, and not be a mm. used car salesman. And it was fun. I learned how to, I worked in the field. I built houses in the field. Um, I did many different things, but the selling part was creating vision for people standing there on a raw piece of land show me what's going to be there. And you have yeah. to tell that story. You have to show them the gables go this way. Your garage comes over to the left and you can see sort of these windows in the front and, you know, and yeah. um, reading blueprints, working with the guys in the field and building homes. And mm. I built my own custom home. Uh, my partner, Mike and I, we built a 7,000 square foot Georgian McMansion on a golf course and we were the general contractors, basically. We had someone looking over our shoulder, too, a little bit. And it was singularly one of the most challenging and also one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. And I remember oh, wow. when the home was finished, and I'm standing there, and the grass seed in the back had not taken yet. The front was sought. 
the lovely, the three and a half acres, the views, this, this man, I couldn't believe I would ever be in this in my life. Mm. And I said to God, if this burns down right now, I'm okay. Cause I did it. We just, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be like living here, but what I just felt such an accomplishment. And uh, that home became a vehicle for so many stories and parties and helping raise the neighbor's children and our families visiting and the pool and so much. So, yeah. but at this point, you know, I'm selling homes and I'm getting very good at it. And I, th- mm. this was some years ago, but it was 15 years ago that it, if you sell about 17 homes a year, you're doing fine, you know, um, 12, 15, 17, maybe 20 is a good year to sell larger, important homes. Um, I was selling 50 homes a year and wow. uh, I was making a lot of money. Now, during that time, there were award ceremonies. I was kind of the guy, my company loved me, sold a lot of homes. We were very busy and it's a, it's a five day a week job. So you can imagine going to work every day in a model home, grabbing coffee. And there you are, you're writing contracts for buying houses. You're showing people, my assistant would make lunch. We would really roll through very busy, the paperwork, the details, people's changes. The, and it was a lot. It was an awful mm-hmm. lot. And on my days off, I would put on a suit and tie and I would get in my car. I would drive downtown to Washington and I would go to Justine Sancho's office, this famous designer, this Dean, you know, inducted into the hall of fame. She's up there. And for some reason she took me under her wing and showed me some stuff. And then she mentored me a little bit and I was bringing my design boards down to her and she would sit there on her with in her office and point to this bedroom that I had made up and say, why did you put this fabric on the window treatments and this fabric on the dust skirts of the beds? And I would look at it and real, Oh my God, I'm sorry. And I would yank it back and say, okay, okay, okay. And I would go home and I would redo it. Mm-hmm. And my next, the very next two days off, I would drive to Washington and be with Justine and show her again. And she said, but the scale is off on this. And why did you, she's from New York. Very tough. She was very tough on me. Right. And I mean, I'm swimming in housing contracts at work. And all I could think of is I've got to work on these design boards because I'm right. and we became friends. Um, I became a pupil. Uh, she became a mentor. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but I quietly got her approval. And something was happening, Michael, where... I learned, you know, you don't need a degree to do this. You don't need it. You don't Mm -hmm. have, you don't have to have the credentials by your name. Um, And, and you could put out a shingle and I don't know what happened, but I remember clearly that there I was in this model home and now really horribly, you know, because I'm, I'm a good guy. I want to work for my employer and I want to do a good job but I was doing interior design stuff while I was at work. Yeah. And, and it was like water coming over a dam. I couldn't stop it. I'm making phone calls to these other designers saying, how did you go into business? How did, what's it like? Or, and it, I was so tentative. I was making $500,000 a year. Mm-hmm. And you know, you're just going to do this thing. And yeah, I did. I gave my two weeks notice and I put up a website and everybody was freaking out. They were like, you are walking away, you, but you're Brad, you're Brad Wiesner, and you're just walking away from this. Mm. You fool. And I mm. said, I, I can't help it. I can't help it. I don't know what it is. I can't help it. And I didn't know anything about how it was going to go. Started in my basement. And then in a minute, I'll launch into what happened. It was like God put gold bricks right in front of us, and it's crazy. So, um, when I, when I left that world of structured corporate employee, employer relationship, it's all I ever did. Mm. Uh, and I, I always did a really good job. I was always successful in what I did. I was a good ambassador of a company. 
um, I train people, develop people, the whole. The, and how I, long were you with them for? Well, with whom, you know, so in the home. Or with selling, the la- yeah, with the home set. That, that was the last one, was it? Yeah. I'll tell mm. you that it must have been a total of 10 years. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty long time, isn't it? Well, it was that's... two different employers. Uh, one okay. was very luxury home builder, NV Homes. I want to plug them because they are they're great. NV, like Northern Virginia, um, they uh, they build luxury homes. And um, I really learned a lot. That was the boot camp. I learned a lot. Mm. Very, very good company. But I was called to another company who really wanted me. And although it was an independent home builder, they build very good homes. And it was a little bit more about volume at that point, but it was the nuance of selling. And um, yeah, and I loved working there as well. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, there comes, I, I believe, you know, just listening to your story and give you a chance to have a drink and a pause. Thank you so much for giving that amazing kind of sure. really, really interesting journey how things evolved and what's so interesting is that you paid attention a lot of us don't pay attention to the signals that we get in our life where things don't feel right and we need to go into a different direction or we kind of go "Mm, no this doesn't feel right or the time's up on this i need to go and do something else uh because most of us stick to the same thing because we're fear of change, we're fear of the unknown. Yep. And it, it just seems like you were very elegantly guided to go in a different route, but you also listened and went, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this different thing. Or I've got this overwhelming feeling about that I need to go into this direction. So Yep. It just sounds to me that your your own intuition is very, very strong. And where do you think that's come from? God. Right. The universe. The universe. Uh, I don't really know how to answer that question, but mm. it's so true. It's so accurate, Michael. I kind of can't believe you just said that because I'm in that I'm in I'm in that galvanizing period in my life here at the moment as well. But Mm. to circle back, you know, my best answer would be that it was a lovely combination. It was a perfect storm of my own personality, my Mm. own, my own personality makeup, what the world presented to me. And to your point, then what did I choose from that? You know? Yeah. But I think that there are people who are self-starters there are people who are motivated. There are people who are self-directed. There are, and there are people who are not. And yeah. sometimes, you know, working for the government at a desk job, at the same job for really 35 years, mm. we need people to do that. And sure. there are people who like that. And they're okay to just come home, turn on the telly, and, you know, and that's fine. To each his own. Um, yeah. There's a beauty in the rhythm of the regular for that. That's not me. Um, I I adore change. And um, to your point, many, many things came together. Yeah. And I I can only look to the universe or or look to God and say, I was guided. And and perhaps there was a reason that I didn't go to New York to the Parsons School of Design and get a degree in interior design Mm. and end up in Manhattan as a designer at 25 years old. And I don't know, I didn't have that life. So, no, I mean, it sounds to me that underneath it all, there is a, I I just can, the only word that comes into my head to describe it is a raw talent, a raw talent that just evolved over years and just grew and grew and grew, that actually outgrew any degree, quite frankly. Exactly. Yeah. I never heard it. I never heard anybody explain it like that. I've never put mm. it into those words. That's exact. That's crazy. I outgrew to me. It was like a waterfall. Water was coming mm. over my head over and I couldn't stop it or, or yeah. it outgrew. And um, there was nothing. I had to get out of the way. Yeah. Cause it, cause it was happening. Um, Brilliant. And to your, to your point, 
once I started may, not even a year into interior design, mm -hmm. I really, I quickly came to the realization that you have trained your entire life for this. You have trained your entire life, yes. your yes. social skills, your selling, the mm. way, the way you easily glide around your clients, that you yeah. listen, that you're, that you're, you're emotive, that you're empathetic, that you listen to your clients and, and, and you want to, you want to improve their lives. Mm. Well, that didn't just happen. You know, that, that no. came from my life experience. Uh, running a business, you've got to make enough money to pay the bills and you've got to count for your money. You got to financials. And I got that. And yeah, you know, well, mm. and then the design part was easy. Turns out it was easy. I trained my whole life for, I That's already, right. knew the, I already knew the fabric lines. I already, there was much, I didn't know. Don't get me wrong. But mm. one, uh, one of the things I share, you know, you go into business for yourself and there's many, many things to be aware of. And I think we, we could talk about today, um, the difference of le leaving a very structured corporate life and there's rules and policies and you come this time, you can leave this time. And it's very, very to mm. an entrepreneur of your own business becomes very unstructured. And if yeah. you don't create your own structure or guardrails, things can get crazy. And I was a little bit of a victim of that, but mm. also um, the vagaries of income up and down and up and down. And, you know, we, yeah. we grew really fast. And in many ways, that's a miracle. It's great, but I didn't manage it very well. We stumbled and that's another story. But so mm. here we are, we've started this interior design stuff and it was as if God was putting gold bricks right in front of me. And I, I rebuilt our lower level of our beautiful home, you know, and I had a working space and place to meet clients and the pool was beautiful, but uh, I, don't, I don't even think it was six months and it was clear this isn't, this isn't big enough. This isn't going to work. We, right. I, I now have two employees already. And, um, I quickly became a dealer of some important furniture lines here in the United States and working with the fabric companies and the antique mirrors and the chandeliers and the showrooms at the Washington DC design center, being a dealer of, of several lines, we, we took some space in, in a small town called Frederick, Maryland. And, um, opened up a, a retail design studio and it was gorgeous. It was very New York. And so it was rich, you know, exposed brick, chocolate, brown carpeting, very rich appointments and chandeliers and antique mirrors and the rugs and the, the lines. And it was pretty expensive stuff. Um, mm. And this was a nice little town. It was a bedroom community of Washington, DC. I was becoming known very quickly, you know, and, um, uh, I don't know that Frederick knew what to do with us. You know, it's, you could walk in and there's a $6,000 chair. You got to be kidding. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, no. It's really because it's, de it's designed by Jacques Garcia and it's, it's the Tierra's chair. It's got, look, it's sitting in it. It's got to look at the detail and the nail heads of the changes. It's so gorgeous. Uh-huh. It's $6,000. <laughs> I'll see you. Bye-bye. And I'm like, okay, bye-bye. So getting started, you know, I could put together a financial business plan for a bank. And I, I knew where the numbers might come from. And I kind of had an idea, but you know, you're supposed to also have your business goals. Yeah. What is your business going to be? What do you want to achieve? Who's your target client? I didn't do any of that. Stupidly. Mm. I, I, I didn't put down on paper. You know, I think writing things down on paper is 50% of achieving a goal, but I now know that in the back of my mind, there was one goal. It was a burning goal. It was a very important goal. And that was that I become good and that I wanted to be known in the industry among my peers. I wanted to be known that I was good because I had trained under Justine Sancho and, yes. and I, I, I demanded of myself that I perform at that level Okay, and and quickly, well, maybe not so quickly, but in a couple of years, people, I could hear my peers and, and folks at the design center. There was a degree of respect. There was a little nod there. I felt like I was coming into my own and I, I stopped trying to design things in a way that would be carefully produced that it would be, ple and I thought, I'm just, I have to do what's in my head. I have to do what I do. I just have to 
do more. To me, it was mm. more. Mm. I, I just moved into um, what I think now is a little bit more of a sophisticated style, a little bit more on the edge of, um, th- I call it thin air up there, um, where you have the elements of interior design that can be you know, safely and more simply put in terms of function, form, space, uh, balance, proportion, symmetry, that's mm-hmm. all fine. When you play with those <clears throat> principles in interior design and you push the tension in a room a little bit and you, you don't just put a glass coffee table a modern coffee table on an antique Persian rug, you, you thrust greater examples and you push that envelope a little bit so that you have really, really compelling rooms. And, and that when you walk in, you are truly transported. Yeah. You feel different when you're in that room and that got noticed. Um, And so, but, and so that was all good. We, um, we had just started. And uh, I remember getting a phone call. Okay, I have to tell the story. I'm brand new. I still have my little briefcase and my pinstripe suit. I look like a banker. And I'm walking <laughs> around the Washington Design Center, right? And I'm a new designer. And I'm going into the showrooms. I'm introducing myself. And they don't know me. They don't care one bit. And uh, I knew who I was going to become. I knew, but they didn't. Well, they, mm. they're going to, you know, and I'm going to tell them. And so I went into one showroom, very important company for me. I won't name them, but to this day, I'm friends with the, I'm friends. I know the owners. I love this company. They produce beautiful things, but they had a guy working in the showroom who was a real jerk. He was rude to me. I didn't like it. So, but I also didn't know the design center. It closes at 5 PM and like a government building, they're out. The lights are gone. It's, I didn't know that. So I was mm-hmm. in a beautiful fabric showroom, Brunswick and Fiel. And, um, this gentleman, Ed was helping me tall, handsome, black suit, crisp cotton, white shirt, bow tie, Southern accent, Ed. And, uh, they started turning off all the lights and I thought, oh shoot, you're closing. He said, would you excuse me just one moment? And boom, all the lights came back on and he helped me for another hour. He knew I was new. He could tell the things I didn't know yet. And he was showing me the printed cottons versus the printed linens. And when we have a double printing or over printing, when you look for the registration, but this is a Belgian linen. No, I know that. Okay. And then here's our wall coverings, our wallpapers. Um, And I left and it dawned on me, this man just stayed an extra hour. He didn't have to, he doesn't know me from Adam. Why Mm. did he do that? Well, anyway, I liked him. And shortly thereafter, he wanted to come out and show my, my staff a fabric presentation. And I thought, I'm not having him drive all the way out to my house to come to my basement. To, I said, no, 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 it's okay. You know, we, we go downtown to see the show. No, no, he wanted to come out. And I thought, you know what? I told my staff, you all dress up. We're going to do this right. This man took care of me and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of him. And so I made a beautiful lunch. And I had now three women working with me, beautiful, dressed beautifully. And my home was lovely. It was on a golf course and every, and so Ed came and it was fun, had a little champagne and showing fabrics, which I get weak in the knees, but then we had lunch out of the pool and it was just beautiful, you know, grilled scallops on a salad and Chardonnay this, and it was so much fun really. And he's, <laughs> a, he's just a little irreverent. I'm like, oh my God. He goes, oh yes. And well, Lily um, accidentally fell in the pool and oh. it was that kind of a day. So anyway, oh, oh well, <laughs> bye-bye, Ed. You know, like, let's clean up here. That was not, it was okay, I guess. So I just knew that I liked this man. It was great. Not too long thereafter, I get this phone call and it's from uh, Talbot County, Maryland is one of the wealthiest counties in America. And many, many people have these big private homes. It's where Sir Bernard Ashley had the Inn at Perry cabin, this Tony exclusive, ultra wealthy place. And they have a historic society that does a designer show house. Well, I, I know that. I've known that since I was a kid. It's, it's kind of the number two show house. Number one was the National Symphony Orchestra in Washington, D.C. But over mm-hmm. here on the Eastern Shore, um, sure. So anyway, I get this phone call and she says, I'm from the Talbot County Historic Society. And I'm thinking, 
I don't, I can't subscribe. I don't know what you want. No, she said, we're doing a decorator show house. And I said, yes, I love it. Okay. Well, we'd like to know if you might want to do a room. Well, wow. and I thought, wait, that isn't how it works. No, <laughs> you have to, you have to claw your way into these. You have to, first of all, you have to find out that it's even happening. Right. And yes. then you stand there in line with 42 other decorators. Like I want this room. I want, you have to fight. You have to like cajole and it's political. Yeah. And you have yeah. to, what? No, she says, you know, oh, I said, you know what? We're brand new. Do you have, I, I think you might not have the right firm. No, this is Brad Wiesner. And I said, yes. Oh, I said, oh, I get it. I get it. You're short of designers and you need help. You need, extra, oh, well, whatever. Yes, I'd be happy. She said, we are not short of designers. You came highly recommended. Wow. And I said, and I'm thinking that's impossible. The system, we're brand new. Um, I said, okay. So we drove down there. And uh, I was educating my, my staff. It's going to be lonely and overgrown and whatever. And um, they're probably going to give us a little closet upstairs or a, you yeah. know, a little yeah. bedroom. I don't care. We're going to yeah. throw down the best boys bedroom, whatever it is. And we have to go in and be the most professional. And as we're being shown around, um, we're being shown the first floor with the primary rooms. And I'm thinking, sure, dining room. I mean, just gorgeous. it's right on the water, you know, and then the main salon right there in the corner on the water. And then there was a room, a large room with a study for your, um, maybe master bedroom. And I'm thinking, uh-huh. Well, I know, I mean, I, I know the room I would choose and mm. I, I'm not going to get, when do we go upstairs and see the closet? <laughs> you know? So it turns out we were given the main salon. Wow. And I, I couldn't understand it. And I'm thinking, oh no. I'm so new. This is my very first show house and um, I have to perform mm -hmm. and it can't be, it just can't be academic. It can't be perfunctory. It can't be just out of a magazine. I mean, it has to be, I knew what it was going to be. Oh my God. I knew what it was going to be. Holy moly, Michael. I saw it and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh wow. The, 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 the thing that I'm passionate about is the idea of back in the day, the, the Parisian salon back mm. when there was salon and wealthy women or folks, you know, would have um, the Disraeli or Monet and Renoir come and these political discussions of art and culture happened in salon, you know, it's a mm. very, well, anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to get the artwork and the story goes long but it involves um, a $65,000 painting in the back of a rented U-Haul truck. And we were pulled over by the police and I had no paperwork for this painting. And there's a story there. Um, <laughs> there, there was a painting that we were going to use and was going to be loaned to us and then was reneged on. And it caused a very last minute change in the entire room, the entire structure. And I had a gentleman help me. There's a painter who I want to plug. His name is um, Kevin Fitzgerald. He's probably my favorite painter, his work. It's very um, plein air. It's, it's landscapey. It's on the Eastern shore. It's um, erythral, uh, not abstract, but, but not literal. It's just gorgeous and perfect for the rooms that I do, these tranquil, calming, contemplative rooms. Mm. And this guy, um, we're freaking out. We have to redo the whole room a different way. I need artwork to start with. I can't just, you know, I can't do everything blue and then find a blue painting. It doesn't, it doesn't work. That, this is much more sophisticated than that. Mm. And this guy in a showroom was saying, I can help you. And I said, dude, I don't think, like, who are you? You can't help me. I need real art. He says, you don't know who I am. I'm an artist, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, isn't that nice? I don't know you, dude. I don't know, you know. No, he says, who's your favorite artist? And I said, Kevin Fitzgerald. And he pulls up his phone and he has Kevin's cell phone number. Right. And I'm like, wait, you know him? Do you know <laughs> Kevin Fitzgerald? He goes, yes, I do. And he's calling him. And I'm like, what the, excuse my French, but what the, what the F are you doing? <laughs> you know, Kevin. And there he is. He's got Kevin Fitzgerald on the phone. And he says, I have a friend who needs help. And we're looking for something to loan. And uh, yeah, he said, what color? And I'm like, what? This is crazy. <laughs> to me, it was crazy. And yeah. um, 
if you had anything dusky pinks or mauve, there's a, I was doing mauve and gray and there's a whole yeah. story around a client, Martha, the mauve and gray story. It's a great story. And I was determined I was going to now switch at the last minute. We'll just do mauve and gray. I'm going to prove mm. to Americans that mauve and gray are not a bad color scheme. Kevin said, I have a few pieces like that. He should come down to the studio. Michael, I thought I was going to die right then and there. I thought I'm going to mm. die. How did God put this and rearrange it? And now not only do I have a piece of artwork that whatever color it is, I'm going to meet Kevin Fitzgerald. Incredible. And I was like a schoolgirl, and I just couldn't. So we, I drive down there. I see a studio. What a lovely man. But there I am. I'm surrounded by all his artwork. Not many people get to go there. He doesn't do that. You know, mm, just mm. couldn't believe it. And he loaned me a magnificently framed large piece. And it was the perfect smoky pinks and dusky roses and the cocoa brown gray. Oh man, it was huge. Um, and this guy, Greg Peoples, helped me, introduce me to two other artists to borrow some pieces. And so as this room all came together, yeah, it was commanding. It was, you know, very fine furniture. I was told it was very well done, but the artwork really carried the day. It was just, you know, amazing. Fantastic. So I thought, well, I think we did okay. I'm like, I, I'm proud of this room. I, wow. And many, many people came through. So mm. a very famous designer at the Eastern Shore, Fiona Weeks, she got the porch outside. And another famous designer got the study, Richard Keith Langham. These people I followed my whole life. Richard Keith Langham. <laughs> Jackie Onassis's designer. Right. And Kelly Proxmire did the dining room. I could go on and on. I'm surrounded mm. by heavyweight interior designers, you know, and I'm in the middle. I just, what if I don't produce, you know, mm. we did, we all did. And the colors were soft and they all worked. But um, I found out later that all the traffic going through my room was very muddy and my carpet was really quite dirty most of the time. Um, and I didn't get over there very often, but Fiona Weeks would vacuum my carpet for me mm. and it wool carpeting. So it all comes right off, but that she did that, you know, and I quickly, I quickly found that the Washington DC group of designers were a club and we were friends right. and we supported right. each other. And there wasn't that insecure weirdness that made everybody testy and not want to know each other. We weren't like mm. that. I could mm. call up Barbara Hawthorne and say, who do you use for banquettes? You know, and I, I would call Mary Douglas Drysdale and, you know, color help me, you know, what do you do? What do you do when this happens or um, have lunch with Lisa Bartolome and I could go on. So mm. uh, the next thing is that we got a phone call from a, a book publisher and they're doing a book of interior designers of Washington, DC. And now Michael, I am not even, I'm not even seven months into this and we had, we're in the middle of doing the show house room. It's not even produced yet. And, and so it's certainly not photographed, but, uh, and they said they were doing a, a book on the best designers of DC. And I said, isn't, I don't want to buy any right now. I know <laughs> that. No, no, no. We want you to be in it. And I said, Oh, I think, <laughs> I think you're mistaken. Cause I'm brand new, you know? No, no, no. Yes. We know you. We saw your website. We, we think that you're a good fit for the book. And, uh, and I said, Oh, I get it. You're How short. Much? Of, right. <laughs> How much you're short of, you're short of designers and you, we are not short of designers. <laughs> highly recommend, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's the same conversation. It's the same conversation. And I'm being told that you're good, that you are starting to get respect mm. and you're not believing it yourself. And that's right. There That's I was. Right. And I said, you all should come over. We'll, we'll talk about it because, and they came and uh, uh, I had, you know, champagne with peaches and lovely, you know, showed them around and yep. And I said, I don't, uh, they said, we'll show you the list of people who are not being invited in the book. <clears throat> and I looked at that list and I went, oh my God, I know these people. Of course you do. Yeah. And I didn't understand it because I don't know. I was brand new. I don't know. And for whatever reason, it's a bigger story than all that, but it's, it's more fun to just tell it this way. Yeah. Um, but uh, so we were published in this book and 
and by then that show house room had been produced and, and shown and mm, uh, mm, we mm. moved into our new space in Frederick. It was very lovely. And it was really a, a an, um, an ingenue. It was a, a, a vanguard in the sense that you're doing interior design and retail out of the same space. And people wanted to come see that. Yeah. And, other, and other designers. And when they would come up, I would show them everything. And I would show them our computer system that we use, which is state of the art. It's called Studio Designer. If you're mm. if you're doing any interior design, folks, in Studio Designer, uh, I'll plug that. It's a very sophisticated program. So mm. I think I just became known for being transparent, supportive. Mm. I'm part of the club. And uh, we would be at conventions like maybe in North Carolina twice a year, the world's largest furniture exposition. It's called High Point. Mm. And mm. Um, if you matter, you go. Yeah. And there we all are. We're hugging each other and sitting with each other, drinking wine. And I've got Gloria Blaylock on my arm and I'm teasing Mary Douglas Drysdale and even Patrick Sutton from Baltimore. He's there with us. And it's just lovely. And people would say, wait, are you all from the same city? And we're like, yeah, we're from Washington, D.C. And <laughs> you, you're friendly with each other? <laughs> In my city, we scratch our eyes out, you know. No, no, yeah. no, we're not. We were. And so... I was never prepared to go to a different city and mm. find, you know, insecure business owners that just couldn't have a cup of coffee. No. And I can feel that. So I do much Incredible. better. I do much better with other designers who are secure um, because you can come to my office. You can see what I do. I would love to show you. I'd love to see mm. your office. How do you do your library? So mm. when you do this, so when you have your um, project manager, uh, what do you have software system or do this? You, and, um, but I don't have to show you my client list. No. And what, there's no secrets here. And if I did show you my client list, so what you can't, mm. you can't be me. Mm, I, that's I, right. I can't be you. And that's what they're yeah. hiring. So why, what are we all afraid of? Anyway. I mean, it's, it's a massive lesson for people in business or looking to get into business because there's a lot of fear around competition, around stealing clients. And I'm like you. I've always believed that if people are interested in getting my clients, go ahead. You know, they're not me. <laughs> they're different. You're, you're, yeah. It's refreshing yeah. to hear, Brad. And the word that comes up for me is authenticity. Um, Sounds to me like your you and your business and your ethos is authentic, very high level of integrity and honesty. And there is no, there's no hidden, uh, well, let's put it this way. You're not a um, prima donna. <laughs> let's put it that way. Well, um, now I will jump in because thank you. And, and yes, you know, I, I aspired to be all those things. Mm. I'm afraid that I pretended to be some of those things. And I'm not sure that I was really, what's the word? I'm not sure that I was really performing at a level that I wanted to in all the areas that you just talked about. Um, and, and maybe so, I hope some people saw that. You know, mm. I, I think at my core, I, I am, you know, integrity, mm. sincere. I think what you see is what you get. But the problem is, is that I started developing a drinking problem. And at, okay. work, every, at work every day in the evenings, we would, you know, it's retail. We would light candles, dim the lights, you know, people would come in and visit friends or whatever people. And, and when we, when we had people come to my shop, it wasn't, let them look around and let them leave. It was, let me show you this. Okay. Do you want to see something really beautiful? It's too expensive, but just sit in this. Isn't that lovely? Or talk about this piece of art, or why the chandelier is what it is. And I got a lot of business from that. You know, a lot of people are like, I think you need to come out to my house. But mm. uh, It was always wine or snacks, candles. Mm. And so every day I got to a place because things were getting busy and we got real busy real fast. And this is the part I wasn't prepared for. Um, right. You, you need to modulate that. You need a throttle or a governor on that engine. And um, I didn't let it come. We couldn't keep up, 
but I thought we were, and there were some troubles. But every day I thought, you know what, at least in the evening, we can turn it off. There'll be wine, have a glass of wine, you know, happy hour, right? Yes. And it turned into 5 p.m. We could start having wine, you know, mm. my staff has a glass and I'm like, this is nice. I can just let go because this was a lot and things were getting a little heady. And I failed to meet a couple of commitments, but it doesn't really matter, Michael, because happy hour starts at four and we'll all be fine. Right. And, um, and then as time went on, it was very much about how, you know, three o'clock is not even a problem. And I didn't know it, but I was, you know, quickly sliding into this um, alcoholic dependency. Wow. And it ended up, it ended up being a problem. And I think, I think I had a little help from clients who didn't pay. We had some ugly experiences and, and I can blame clients for that. I can blame circumstances. I can blame, but I have to look at myself and say, I didn't have a financial cushion. I didn't manage my company to be in the stratosphere. You know, there's, there's things that you need to protect yourself that you're not vulnerable. I didn't really do that. And so I, I look to myself, I blame myself for not have, not being able to be elastic or not being able to suffer a blow. And those blows came, I take them. I'm a very emotional guy. I'm, what you see is what you get. Mm. And, and I don't have a thick skin. So these blows that would come really hurt. They really affected me, but don't worry. There's always a glass of wine. Mm. And so, um, I really screwed up and ended up letting my company kind of coast along. Um, mm. We moved to Baltimore, Maryland. And I thought, okay, fresh start. Come on, pay attention. Yeah. yeah. I get to this different town. Now, Washington always saw Baltimore as its little stepsister. Um, I just imagine like if you're, a, if you're in London and you grew up in London and then it, would it be Liverpool? Would it be... A, a little bit more of an industrial city that's not as color, more, more, you know, mm. we didn't really look favorably on Baltimore and there I am. I'm living in, I never wanted to move to Baltimore. There we are. And I'm reaching out to other designers there and they don't want to, no, 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 no. They're no. secure, not going to talk, not going to play. And I felt like I was on an Island. I felt like this was not a new town. This was purgatory. I mm. just, and it wasn't good. And my business failed mm. and I, I could, that's a whole different story. And I'm very happy if you ever want to have me back on again, we can talk about, you know, the downfall of a business, you know, and then, and then what do you do? So that happened. We, mm. um, but I, I have uh, rebranded to my grandfather who John Hildreth Forshoe and decided that I, I wanted to be more careful this time. I ended up going to rehab in Texas and I've been sober now. Um, today actually is my 11 year anniversary for being sober. And so Good man. congratulations. Much, thank you. And much has happened in that time. Um, mm. Not just a rebranding of a company, but I think a rebranding of me and yeah. uh, you know, how careful am I going to be? The, the, I'm not going to stop doing interior design and good. And if you failed once, then you know what not to do. And, sure. and if you're going to do this thing, do it right. And um, have a higher degree of commitment to um, being prepared, long-term planning, financial management, yada, yada, mm. yada. So mm. Mm. I'm, I'm now in Pennsylvania in this beautiful town. Oh my gosh. I feel like it might be somewhere in cost walls. I don't know. It's just idyllic. It's just, <laughs> there's a big cultural footprint here. There's museums and art and theater in this little city. And um, I'm just having the time of my life and I'm, I'm doing really good work. And I, I could also say, what is it like afterwards? And it's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. So great. I don't well, know. That, I, I talked an awful lot. No, I, I really appreciate you sharing that, you know, last point because i think you know that crisis that you went through in your life i think a lot of us go through these crises you know or crises in our lives 
hopefully it's only one that we have to endure. Mm -hmm. But suffering is part of being human. And it depends how it shows up in our lives. You know, we all have a degree of suffering that we go through, um, that we have to contend with. If we get through it, which most of us do, then it's a good thing. And you can look back on it and go, yeah, I went there, but I got through it. And I'm at the other end and I'm a better person for it. Mm -hmm. Because, yes, yeah, sometimes we do need to go rock bottom in order to, you know, soar again, uh, come, out of, come out of the other end. Sometimes it happens earlier in life, sometimes a little bit later. For me personally, it happened later in life, I think. I wish I had it out of the way at a much younger age, but yes, you know, you yes. can't you you can't design these things always. So um, well, thank you for sharing that. And uh, that's an important point to you know let our listeners kind of contemplate <laughs> in their own lives and their business lives and and how they're going to be dealing with that at some point. Because I, I think the big message is almost all of us go through it. And when you're in it, it feels very stigmatized. You feel like you're alone. It's very embarrassing. And I think that you need to know that others have gone through this and, and that it is, it is not to be taken lightly. And there's no. a gravity to it. And, and I know that I, I hurt people in my failings. Mm. But businesses fail. Businesses yeah. are human beings and human beings are messy and, and, and businesses can fail and yeah. they're, you know, simply doing business with each other. There's inherent risks. And we forget that because we're caught up in the marketing of all of it. But I think that when you're an entrepreneur and you have a big setback a failing, I hope you have people to reach out to call me yes. and I'll say, it's going to hurt. So buckle in go for the ride. It's going to really hurt, but you're going to be okay. And actually you won't believe this right now, but you're going to be better. Yeah. Uh, and you just have to go through it. And, and um, yeah. There's a, there's a great phrase. A friend of mine had a little picture on the wall and there's just some very simple words on it. And I hold those words very dear when there are any dark times in business or in life or in the world. And that is, this too will pass. And uh, it helps when you're of a certain age, when you can look back and say, and that's true. That's correct. <laughs> and that's true. I happen to know that for a fact. Yeah. This yeah. too shall pass. Yeah. Because when you're younger, you don't see it that way. It's, it's no, it's a horrible. That's the end. I've lost everything. It's like, that's right. You know, you never lose you. Correct. Correct. And, uh, Brad, I'm, I'm conscious of time because you have another meeting um, coming up. True. I really appreciate chatting with you. It was fascinating. I know there are so many more stories and it probably would be interesting to get you back on at some point. But for now, there's a lot to absorb there. And I really appreciate it. I still believe that despite everything that happened and even the person that you were before you believed it all went wrong, where of course I believe it all went right, um, is that uh, the authenticity, the integrity, the honesty is there. And it's explained even through you sharing that story about what you went through. So I, I, I really, really appreciate that. Tell the okay. listeners where they can learn more about you, get in touch with you, and perhaps hire you for their interior design. Um, we have not done work in the United Kingdom yet, and I would love to. So, But this podcast also goes out in the USA and everywhere in the world. So. <laughs> it does, yeah. I, uh, I, I, I am often on a um, radio station called Chat and Spin. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Yes. But yeah, I've been on it. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I talked to those guys. We would we would love to do projects. We we do interior design for commercial environments as well as residential environments, and mm -hmm. we do upscale uh, uh, environments that are calming, uh, rather classic uh, in their form, uh, a little bit edited, um, 
and, and calming and sophisticated interiors. So mm, we, mm. we take time to get to know the client, whether that's a brand, it's a company, it's a restaurant or a law firm. I really want to know the company, their motto, their culture, and, and how to create their boardroom that, that echoes. Or my residential clients, how do they live? Does the dog sleep in the bed with you? I want to create a home that really looks like you. I want your friends, and they do. We're known, we're known for people saying, how did he get you? He got you and Tom. How did he do that? You know. Mm, so, mm. Um, uh, and we work mostly on the East Coast of the United States, but really as interior design, you can do it anywhere. I mean, we just did a hotel, a beachfront hotel in North Carolina. I've done a, a doctor's office, a beautiful doctor's office in, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And then beach homes, and restaurants and things. So um, Great. my company is Forshoe Design. It's named after my grandfather, John Hildreth Forshoe. So it's F-O-R-S-H-E-W design.com. And uh, you can find us there. I also do a podcast called Well Designed Lives. And I have varied guests where we talk about beauty and where do we find beauty? And, mm. and that, can, that can even be in a story like I just shared with you, how a cataclysmic failing of a business can actually be a phoenix rising from the ashes. And there's a beauty, you know, in that process. I talked yes. to people who have children or youth organizations, um, scholastic. I talk to artists and, and have um, personal conversations. So it's called welldesignedlives.com. Okay. Fabulous. So that's us. Yeah. Great. Well, I'll include those in the show notes and uh, people can get in touch with you. They need some help in all of those areas. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate your story. Wishing you amazing success with the, the new business and the new identity. And uh, if you ever come to London, do let me know. I'm a, I'm a wait outside of london but i can get on a train and we can have some lunch uh that will be cool are you kidding if if i come i so yeah i i would absolutely come to see you okay brilliant yeah. thank you brad take care thank bye you. for now it was really good thank you i appreciate being here thank you michael if you've enjoyed this podcast please rate subscribe and share at will i'm always looking for more listeners and guests so do get in touch please you can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.